Mother. There is no other gaming franchise that has impacted me the way that it has. Aside from my affinity for the games, the profound influence the series has had on millions of people around the world is astounding. For only having a trilogy of titles, the Mother series is arguably one of the largest cult followings you will ever see. Quirky characters, witty dialogue, and mature thematic elements and symbolism cause players to get immersed in its environments, pose their own theories, and assimilate thoughts on the message boards of sites like Starman.net. I've done a lot of videos about the series, ranging from theories to character analysis and fan games, but the one thing I really haven't elaborated on is the games themselves. But what is left to contribute that hasn't already been said? Surely, with the thousands of Mother-related videos out there, I couldn't possibly add anything unique, right? Honestly, I went back and forth on whether or not I wanted to make a video about the games because it can be difficult for me to put in words exactly how the series has made me feel. Here I am, nonetheless. This isn't purely a history video. It's not a retrospective. It's not a review. This is a story. A story revolving around the genesis of my favorite video game franchise of all time. A story of how a renaissance man's vision came to light. A story of how the most unique JRPG series impacted so many, including myself, on a deeply emotional level. A story of my own journey through playing the game and the thoughts and feelings I had along the way. Welcome to the story of Mother. For a game series as polarizing as Mother ended up being, it is no doubt that its very creator, Shikasato Itoi, would be just as much so. Not many people can reach as widely into their skill set to achieve some of the things that he has done over his life. The 70-something year old has been a fisherman, copywriter, gold miner, iron chef judge, video game producer, voice actor, dancer, songwriter, and ant observer. Yes, this is a real hobby and not just something poor kids like myself did at the end of their driveway in the 90s. He is quite possibly one of Japan's most interesting men as he continues to excel in everything that he does while spreading joy and happiness to those in his wake. Shigesato Itoi was born on November 10th, 1948 in Meibashi, a small town in the Gunma prefecture of Japan. His parents divorced when he was very young, and he ended up being raised primarily by his grandmother. Early in his life, he was sort of a self-appointed hooligan, always acting as a punk, and he often confided in manga as some sort of a solace. As with many high school kids, his desires for the future varied quite a bit. At one point, he wanted to be a mangaka, which is basically somebody that draws manga, then an essayist, and even a hat maker, though I haven't even found confirmation of that one. After high school, Itoi even joined various social justice causes in Japan and attended the prestigious Hosei University of Tokyo before abandoning his studies altogether. He went into limbo for a while before going back to school for copywriting. If you're as unfamiliar as I am with the art of copywriting, I'll catch you up. In the 1970s and 80s, one of the largest novelties in Japan existed in copywriting, or the subtext after a movie title. It's basically a slogan for a product or something of that nature. Itoi started out his copywriting journey by creating jingles and slogans for Japanese companies, channels, and rock bands. But he certainly didn't stop at that. One tidbit that I've always found intriguing about his past is his connection to Miyazaki and Studio Ghibli's early years. In fact, Itoi acted as a copywriter for many of Miyazaki's films, including Kiki's Delivery Service. Although copywriting is not nearly as prevalent today, there was a huge demand for it during those years. Aside from copywriting, Itoi also explored his more creative side by dabbling in short fiction. In 1981, he co-authored a collection of short stories titled Let's Meet in a Dream, with writer Haruki Murakami, one of Japan's most famous fictional authors. 
Murakami himself was amazed by Itoi's method of storytelling, in that it was equal parts unsettling and lighthearted. Itoi credited this brief period of being an author for the inspiration behind his work on the Mother series. You want to make something memorable, he said. You want to combine as many emotions as possible into one setting. Don't just make something dark for the simple fact to do so. Combine it with comedy or joy. Juxtapose sadness and hope. That is where people will draw to. Given the dominating cultural impact that video games had on the Japanese in the 80s, it was no surprise that Shigesato Itoi was an avid gamer himself. Despite the understandable lack of free time he had, he spent it playing many hours of the Famicom, the Dragon Warrior series in particular. He enjoyed that video games had started to go beyond basic task-oriented cartridges and were starting to focus more on story elements. It was all very fascinating to him at the time, and of course, he began to formulate ideas of how to create his own game. While playing the Dragon Warrior series and many others, Itoi often thought to himself, what changes would he make if he was in charge of the game's development? One of his great ideas was to create an RPG in a modern setting. RPGs in a medieval Europe setting are definitely flourishing these days, but I don't know anything about medieval Europe. This opinion is the main reason Itoi avoided RPGs for years. Sure, the gameplay and story was sensational, but in many ways it didn't connect to the player. It all felt sort of stale. He wanted something relatable. None of us are chiseled warriors wielding three-foot swords against hordes of goblins, so why not create something that players can really empathize with? It got him thinking, what type of game would Steven Spielberg create if given the chance? It made his mind run wild. Over many months, Itoi drafted up some ideas for his own game, packed with many of the same traits his short stories had contained over the years. There was just one teensy weensy problem. Despite Itoi's mountain full of ideas, he didn't have anyone to show them to. Itoi had tons of connections throughout Japan, but really nobody related to Nintendo or video games in general. However, everything changed one day when he appeared on television discussing the impact that video games had in his life. He spoke very highly of Mario and how it saved him, remembering how he suffered from terrible asthma unless he was sitting up, and how playing the platformer helped him get through a rough time. Apparently, the president of Nintendo himself was watching the clip on television and decided to get in contact with Itoi about an upcoming game the company was set to release. Finally, Shigesato Itoi had his big break, he was called to Nintendo as an expert of sorts to discuss Miho Nakayama's Heartbeat High School. Yeah, it's a game I haven't heard of either. Eagerly awaiting his moment, Itoi handed some copied pages of his idea to Shikiro Miyamoto during one of their meetings. Unfortunately for him, Itoi's adventurous idea didn't garner much of any kind of positive response from the Nintendo icon. Perhaps he felt it was one more celebrity trying to get their shot at creating a game and Miyamoto didn't take kindly to the idea. It seemed Miyamoto hadn't realized how much time and effort I'd put into this, and he told me, I know it's a lot of work, but how about starting over from the beginning and making it simpler? I took his words in a good way, but other people seemed to think it was Miyamoto's way of telling me, please stop. Because of that, I became hesitant to talk with others about what I was doing. He swiftly put Itoi's notes away, mentioning he'd be in contact if anything came up. Itoi was absolutely crushed. In an interview, he mentioned that he was so devastated by Miyamoto's rejection that he actually cried on the way home. He knew his ideas were good, but it seemed that he was just too out of his element in the video games industry. Despite being called in as an expert in one breath, he wasn't being taken seriously in the next. What Itoi didn't know is that Miyamoto was actually intrigued by many of his ideas. What held him back from immediately greenlighting the project was the failure of past celebrity-endorsed video games, as well as doubt whether or not Itoi would remain invested throughout development. Weeks and months went by, until one day, Mr. Imanishi at Nintendo called him to let him know that his project was greenlighted. And bam, out of nowhere, Itoi's dream game became a reality.
Eager to get started on the game's production, Itoi had a specific office rented out for his new team, which would come to be known as Ape Incorporated. It would soon be joined by other external figures such as visual artist Minami Shinbo, who worked as a character designer. Itoi was also pretty serious about the soundtrack, and two composers were brought in. Hirokazu Tanaka, a senior Nintendo composer who worked on the company's earliest arcade titles, as well as on classics like Metroid or Tetris, and Keiichi Suzuki, a friend of Itoi's and the leader of alternative rock band called the Moonriders. Itoi's goal for the development team was to seem less like a structured job and more like a club where like-minded individuals would gather and share ideas in hopes of making the most organic game they could. Nintendo did their best to accommodate Itoi's wishes, and ultimately this approach paid dividends in terms of the game's overall quality. It was obvious from a very early point in Mother's development that Itoi was not just along for the ride in order to make a quick buck. He was literally willing to do whatever it took to make his dream a reality. Whether that was performing stereotypical grunt work or providing overarching ideas, Itoi-san proved himself to Nintendo and the entire development team. Itoi's vision for the game was essentially a culmination of everything that he knew. A modern day setting, though certainly out of the ordinary for most RPGs of that time, was picked because of Itoi's limited knowledge of medieval environments and lore. Not only that, but he felt as though it would make the game more relatable. One of the aspects that Itoi wanted to convey in Mother was to essentially blur the lines between fantasy and reality, and by having the game take place in present day, it would allow the players to see themselves in the game. Mother was to take place in a interesting portrayal of the Western world. The main characters of the story were set to be ordinary people like you and I, and instead of enchanted staffs and swords, weapons and items for the game would be normal household items like frying pans and hamburgers. Because seriously, I mean, who doesn't love a hamburger? Itoi said of the modern setting, So I thought if I'm going to make something, then a modern day story would be more than interesting. A story that takes place in the world as we see around us today, with kids of today, talking with people of today, having all manner of adventures. Earlier I had gone to Chicago for a job. I fell in love with the houses and the streets I saw there, and I made great use of that experience for Mother. Itoi also wished to combine some elements of the supernatural in order to create some sort of strife for the characters to combat along the way, taking heavy amounts of inspiration from Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey, one of Itoi's favorite films at the time. Thus the realization of modern day people, animals, and objects becoming possessed by occult entities and attacking people of the mother universe at will. Things were starting to come together for the development team, but the game still didn't have a name. Part of the joy surrounding Itoi's mind and the reasons for him doing things is that literally everything he does has some sort of influence. Even if it wasn't directly related to the plot of the game, his wide array of life inspirations were present at every turn. The name Mother was picked as the game's title partially due to that John Lennon song of the same name that made Itoi cry the first time he heard it. In addition to that, Itoi felt that the name Mother was very unique in the whole scheme of things because it was very unassuming and therefore relatable. There is no quest, fantasy, warrior, or any other token RPG phrase that could cause the purpose of the game to be misconstrued. Mother was a game that was supposed to be relatable to the person playing it and allowing them to become part of the experience. Another aspect of Mother's name that I personally found interesting was the existence of an absent father figure in the first two games in the series. According to Itoi, this paralleled his own childhood quite a bit because his father was away on work for long periods at a time, leaving his mother to do most of everything else. This is emulated not only in the title of the first two games, but Ninten and Ness's fathers only existing as distant voices on the phone, depositing money into your account to help you on your journey. There was also a Famitsu interview with Itoi in 1987 where he said the name of the game was in part derived from the term Mothership, or the game's relationship with paranormal alien encounters. The backbone for Mother had been laid while Itoi and the team at Ape began constructing the framework and character outlines as development for the game continued. As soon as you begin Mother, you are greeted with some explanatory text revolving around the game's genesis. 
In the early 1900s, a dark shadow covered a small country town known as Podunk in rural America. George and Maria, a young couple, mysteriously vanished, having been abducted by aliens. While in captivity, they raised a young alien named Geeg as if he were their own child. The only problem with this was that Geeg was not a child, and therefore George looked more upon him as a research subject while Maria raised Geeg as a mother would to a son. About two years after he initially went missing, George returned with extensive knowledge of PSI, a psychic ability utilized by Geeg's secret alien race. He didn't discuss where he had been or what he had been doing, and unfortunately, Maria never returned. Distraught and angry of George's escape, the aliens order Geeg to reclaim the knowledge that George stole before the humans could use it against them. The premise is actually quite interesting because of how much assumed lore there has been pieced together by members of the Mother community. There's quite a bit of unconfirmed backstory on George and how he was an investigative journalist during the early 1900s, succumbing to abduction due to his incessant coverage of other supernatural events and abductions taking place in his town. Mother was set to take place in the 1980s, centered around one of the most unassuming characters, a 12-year-old boy named Ninten. Ninten is an ordinary boy, with seemingly no special abilities of his own, but has a love for baseball and is the great-grandson of Maria and George. A mysterious alien race led by Geeg has started to possess people, animals, and objects in his town, and Ninten ventures off in hopes to solve the occult crisis himself. This is actually quite similar to most other RPGs, though the contrast of the time period makes Ninten's adventure seem all the more strange, creating a sort of satire of traditional RPG storylines. Like, imagine if as a 12-year-old boy your mother let you wander the earth to beat down zombies and possessed objects using a baseball bat. Nintendo's name origins may seem quite obvious to you as a shortening of Nintendo, the company that produced the mother games. This name was also commonly used as a placeholder for many other games created by Nintendo in the 80s and 90s. But for some reason, the name ended up sticking in Mother. Unironically, in the Famicom version's instruction booklet, Nintendo's name is actually Boku, the Japanese word for me, because in essence, the main protagonist's name was left entirely up to the player. Due to Nintendo not having an official name during the novelization of Mother, his name ended up being written as Ken in this version, making him have a grand total of three different official names during his history. Throughout his journey to dispel the evil alien race from planet Earth, Ninten is joined by several other characters, such as Pippi, a seven-year-old girl that only briefly makes an appearance in the game, Lloyd, an elementary kid with a knack for inventions, Anna, a girl with a keen sense for PSI, and Teddy, a gang leader turned kid protector who is without question my favorite character in the game. They're a ragtag bunch of heroes, but each with their own backstory relevant to experiences that Itoi-san himself went through in his life. Lloyd even has a Japanese name, Royd, a comical take on the round glasses and overall nerdy appearance. And at least according to Itoi himself, Teddy was explained to have a funny role. He likened his existence to that of Koji Surata, a notable actor for his funnier roles in earlier Japanese films. What's funny too is throughout the creation of Mother, a lot of the characters seem to get a likeness comparison to that of Peanuts, the Charles Schultz comic strip. And you know, I can kind of see it, and I can also see why this could have pretty bad copyright implications later, so there's a lot of censorship later on that. The very existence of PSI was conceptualized by Itoi to be something deep within someone that can be awakened and utilized by the individual. In this way, I liken it to something like spirit energy from the anime series Yu Yu Hakusho, or quirks like in Boku no Hero. These psycho abilities, also known as ESP, come in a wide variety of uses and power levels. Some PSI abilities aren't even that useful at all, adding to their believability. PSI was a way to mimic the traditional magic of JRPGs and help it fit into the modern day environment Itoi had built, and I for one felt that it fit quite nicely. In fact, the existence of PSI in the Mother series has been said to be the inspiration for many other similarly constructed magic systems in modern games. 
As the game continues on, Ninten and his friends go from battling normal people and animals until more powerful beings tied to Geek's race like Starman emerge. This all culminates into one final battle against Geek himself with the fate of the world at stake, all at the hands of a young boy. A traditional good and evil narrative juxtaposed against a setting that is relatable to each and every person playing through the game. Itoi wanted the game and the individual playing it to be as connected as possible. One of the most impactful things about playing through Mother to me was the seamless involvement of the player into the game's universe. The first two games especially seem to break the fourth wall without overtly doing it, and it makes me feel a sense of connection I've never really experienced in a video game before. Itoi sought to craft this immersive experience when developing Mother, paying heavy homage to a movie he saw earlier in his life, The Tigers, the world's waiting for us. During an interview, Itoi spoke of the moment that wowed him in the film. At one point, a band is playing when the lead singer asks the theater audience to raise their voices with him, and in one strong movement, unites the viewer and the actors in one fluid experience. Although this method of seamless presentation was more prevalent in Mother 2, the concept was still alive and well in the inaugural title. As mentioned previously, Itoi became a larger driving force in the development of Mother than anyone on the team initially thought was possible. Seeing his past experiences as a copywriter as a strength, Miyamoto actually called upon Itoi to craft some of the dialogue in the game, which he welcomed with open arms. To Itoi, dialogue was one of, if not the most important aspect of creating a game. Much like the varying degree of PSI, NPCs in the game range greatly in their level of importance. Most older JRPGs stuck to pivotal plot progression dialogue, which caused many characters to appear contrived or stale or strictly plot conveniences, rather than people carrying out their everyday lives. In the real world, Itoi said, some people wouldn't want to talk to a random 12-year-old boy and his group of friends. In fact, some people wouldn't have anything important to say at all. But that's just the beauty of Mother. Every NPC has their own story. Whether it's a guy with a haunted house who's just enjoying life in the great outdoors, or the queen relaying pertinent information to your quest. You never know what someone's gonna say. There are over 300 people in the game, and almost no one speaks the same lines. Maybe three people in total say the same thing. It's a huge expansion compared to other RPGs, even considering the dialogue alone. With Mother, I learned how difficult words can be. As development continued to roar, Mother resumed proving its uniqueness. Although the game does consist of random encounters, instead of traditional overworld, it sought to connect its world by making every screen connect to the last. In a way, this makes the world both big and small, and gives the player a bigger sense of progression while playing through the game. In addition to this, the battle system itself paid homage to the more traditional RPGs in terms of its turn-based combat. Though not a direct influence, Itoi considered the combat of Dragon Quest III to have the biggest impact on him and his abilities to craft the same in Mother. However, in addition to the characters being able to use PSI, Itoi added plenty of his own flair into the battle system. Sometimes enemies will say strange things if the right attacks are used. Occasionally, Ninten will suffer from asthma attacks, which can affect his performance in battle. Cool kids with asthma. Shake, shake, shake that medicine. The traditional burned or frozen status ailments are superseded by such things as blinded, puzzled, confused, and bound, just to name a few. This continued onto Itoi's later mother games as well, and helps to add to the charm and uniqueness of the title. Given Itoi's history with music, it was evident that he would end up wanting the most out of his game soundtrack. He asked his friend Keiichi Suzuki, co-founder of the Moonriders in Japan, for help in composing the game's soundtrack, since Suzuki's musical background would provide an excellent influence to the feel that Itoi was aiming for. In addition, Hirokazu Tanaka was hired by the team at Nintendo, but from the very beginning of his collaboration with Itoi, the game's creator felt that they weren't really communicating very well. Itoi said, I didn't want the music to be your standard video game background music, you see. His technique was incredible, however, and in the course of composing demo after demo, he came to understand me, and we built a relationship of trust between us. 
Despite not working on video games in the past, Suzuki and Tanaka eventually clicked as well, but things were still slow at the beginning. The NES was only able to play three notes at a time, which Suzuki had noted greatly limited what he was able to produce. He couldn't create some of the sounds that he wanted. This caused some more complex tracks such as Pollyanna to be rewritten up to five times before a final version was settled on. The team was able to work through their problems and create something brilliant. If you have played Mother, you would know that firsthand the music ended up being anything but traditional. Mother's OST is part comical, part ambient, and even has a few unsettling tracks. The culmination of the soundtrack really explains anything that the team and Nintendo thought was possible on the console. Unlike most RPGs that contained a certain theme, Mother was all over the place, and it was brilliant. Itoi wanted the music to blend in so that it became one with the game's corresponding atmosphere. Some of my favorite tracks include the roving tank theme, Pollyanna, and the intro. Mother's soundtrack was so revolutionary for the NES that Suzuki and Tanaka ended up releasing a studio album the month following the physical game release, highlighting some of the more popular tracks from the game and incorporating lyrics that emphasize the themes of the game like love, friendship, and courage. It's an incredible listen for any fan of Mother or really music in general, and its own backstory to how it was recorded is fascinating. The album was actually recorded across eight separate recording studios in England and even incorporated a chamber choir into the Eight Melodies rendition. I highly recommend it. Contrary to the other titles in the series, Mother is the only one that didn't risk cancellation at some point. However, that doesn't mean that there weren't plenty of struggles with the development along the way. Shigesato Itoi was a hard-working, ambitious man, but even he has his limits. He often commuted to the office by plane or train, only traveling back home to sleep. Over time, this began to weigh on him, and he ended up spending a significant amount of time actually sleeping in his office as to not lose any margin to the game's release. The game took a relatively short amount of time to produce. From 1987 to 1989, thus the crunch time at the end was inevitable. To make matters worse, some effects from the game's rush nature showed up in the final product. If there's one thing about the original Mother, it was the brutal difficulty curve, especially in the later areas, notably Mount Itoi. I remember pretty much steamrolling through the whole game until I got here and thinking, what in the world? Am I even playing the same game here? Even Shigeru Miyamoto admitted that he only ever ended up beating Mother within the game's debug mode. This clip from Itoi says it all. As development for Mother was nearing its conclusion, Itoi and the team at Ape were anxious to show their game to the public. Many members of the team worked around the clock to ensure that the game was as best as it could possibly be, and after showing the mostly finished product to Miyamoto and the rest of the higher execs, the company felt that it was time for a reveal showcase. え、one of my favorite parts about this video was just how out of sorts Itoi looked. Granted, he had been in the spotlight in Japan for many years prior to Mother's development, but you can tell by his nervous demeanor and hesitant speaking that this press release certainly meant a lot to him. Much like the short stories he had collectively written with Murakami, this game showcased all of his innermost ideas and inspirations. Mother was essentially a part of him, 
a slice of his life. He wanted the world to know the refreshing take that he had on the medium, but was understandably nervous about how Japanese gamers would take to his out-of-the-box thinking. This infamous press release was broadcasted in March of 1989, and for all intents and purposes, succeeded at drawing interest and attention to Mother's release in Japan. Pictures and mini footage for the game started littering Japanese publications and television commercials, and gamers all over the country were intrigued. There were also a few commercials produced for the game that in hindsight probably made people intrigued, confused, and disinterested all at the same time. Take this advertisement for example. Would that make people want to play the game? Itoi and Miyamoto both have admitted that the advertising for all three mother games missed the mark. I found this extremely interesting given the prominent history Itoi had with the entertainment industry, but I find it endearing that he can laugh about it in the present day. Mother was released on the Famicom in Japan on July 27, 1989 to relative critical acclaim. The game sold almost 150,000 copies in its first week and 400,000 copies total for 1989, making it the sixth best-selling game that year. Many players praised the game's unique approach to the fantasy RPG and it became an instant cult classic amongst Japanese gamers. It even scored a 31 on Famitsu, certainly a respectable score for such an ambitious title by Itoi and the team at Ape. He was overjoyed with the instant success of his title and some of the positive things gamers had to say about it. Due to the success of the game in Japan, there were immediate calls to release it in North America, which the team was already in progress of doing. During the years following Mother's release, Nintendo was chugging along with a North American port of the game, entitled Earthbound. However, after the debut of the Super Famicom in 1990, there was some hesitancy on behalf of Nintendo to give this game a proper release in the West. Unfortunately, there was no concrete or specific answer as to why this occurred, but one thing is for certain. A lot of it appeared to fall on the release of the SNES. Nintendo simply didn't want to take the plunge into releasing a first-party title over two years after its initial game was released. There was also the common misconception on behalf of Japanese game developers and executives that Westerners were not interested in JRPGs. This was made evident due to only one Final Fantasy game being released on the NES and the existence of games like Mystic Quest on the SNES. Many at Nintendo looked at the North American gamer's fondness with video arcades as a strong hurdle to cross as well. Most of the popular games in the US were skill-based, and games that would have a definitive end. Games outside of this were not normally so well received. Even though Mother didn't initially get released, many people are unaware just how close the port was to completion. Issue 24 of Nintendo Power featured a small write-up about the game in 1991, which got many people interested. Other publications soon followed suit. There was even talk that the full translation was finished, just waiting for the green light from Nintendo. And that, unfortunately, never came. It wasn't until I got around to watching an interview from 2014 that I really learned the truth. According to Phil Sandhoff, a localizer for Nintendo of America in the 80s and 90s, the localization of Mother was completely finished when Nintendo decided to scrap it. He originally worked on the translation and localization for Final Fantasy as well, and he recalled being touched by Mother's charm and music. Many changes, too many to list in this video, were made during this localization, including the addition of the run button, which was initially only in the debug mode, and many taboo items being omitted from the game entirely like the smoking crow and some blood dripping off of another enemy. The game manual was also even set to contain an extensive look into the game, with one side displaying the name of the game, while the other said Great Grandfather's Journal, a nod to Nintendo's Great Grandfather George. Even Itoi himself dropped by incognito to check on things, making sure Phil and his team weren't messing anything up. He was initially labeled as a programmer by the original Mother game, but over time his real identity was revealed much to the surprise of Phil and the rest of his team. He just wanted to, you know, come in incognito and, and make sure you're okay. And, and, and meet you, and, meet you and, and make sure you weren't destroying his game. 
One of the most interesting parts of Phil's story is that he was credited for the very name of the game Earthbound. Thinking that Mother didn't sound too appealing for an RPG being played by Western teenagers across America, one day he randomly thought of Earthbound, which he and some others stewed upon for quite a while before ultimately becoming the official English translation title. Spacebound was even considered for a sequel title, but we all know how that one turned out. Unfortunately, despite the immense amount of work from Sandhop and his team, the Nintendo executives couldn't get past the fact that Mother was an RPG and would eventually struggle to sell in the US. And poof! Just like that, the localization was scrapped in one fell swoop. Phil mentioned that he had placed his cartridge of Mother in a desk drawer never to be seen again. All evidence of Mother's English release was wiped from history. Or was it? As the 90s came to a close, collecting for the NES became wildly popular amongst gamers across the world. However, there was one specific story from a Washington collector known as Greg Mariotti that brought light the existence of the Earthbound Zero prototype. Greg had been collecting for the NAS for a number of years, often getting amazing deals from a shop in Washington known as Famcom Games. Aptly named now, wasn't it? In one particular exchange, the owner gave him a prototype NES cartridge. Not only this, but he did it for free. Something nice for having always been such a great customer. The cartridge was a bit strange. Greg ended up playing it once or twice and put it back on the shelf and forgot all about it for many years. How the Famcom store owner came to be in possession with this prototype is unknown, but given the relative close proximity between his shop and the Nintendo of America headquarters, some easy inferring can be done. It wasn't until Greg was trying to save money for a house that he did some more research and poked around on the internet forums to gauge interest in the prototype. To his surprise, not knowing whether the game was indeed real caused some mild interest at best. Keep in mind, this was in the early 2000s when emulation was just starting to come into its own. There were plenty of hacks out there and plenty of fake games. And on top of that, the Mother series hadn't quite launched itself into cult classic status yet. Eventually, an eager fan of the series by the name of Kenny Brooks purchased the prototype from Greg for about 100 bucks and the real fun began. During the time of Kenny's purchase of the Earthbound prototype, Demi of Neo Demi Force, a ROM translating group, had been working on a fan translation of Mother 1. The news that a prototype English version existed caught people's attention. So eBounding got Kenny and Demi in contact with each other. Kenny was unwilling to sell the cart or even let Demi rent it so he could dump the ROM and send it back since this would probably lower its value. Eventually, Kenny did agree to let him borrow it for 400 bucks so he could dump the ROM before sending it back. The small community on Demi's site quickly pooled the $400 together, and the ROM was dumped and spread online days later. And, well, the rest is kind of history. Once fans latched onto the English translation of Mother, all rumors of it being fake pretty much faded away. The subtle differences between this and the original game were too small and plentiful to be a mere hack. This had some substance behind it and seemed entirely legitimate. Even I jumped on the bandwagon and bought a copy of the prototype, as is evident by my ancient YouTube video. Phil Sandhop and others attested to the prototype's legitimacy, and it wasn't long until word spread amongst the mother and emulation communities of this piece of gaming history. Over the next several years, confirmation of four additional prototypes further proved the initial's legitimacy, one of the most fascinating stories of localization ever told. The documentary Mother to Earth highlights the existence and ownership of the infamous prototype and is worth a watch just to hear the stories from Phil, Greg, and others who have extensive knowledge of the situation. In order to help drive up interest for the upcoming release of Mother 3, Nintendo ported a combination cartridge of Mother 1 and 2 to the Game Boy Advance in 2003. Much like the previous iteration, this game was only released in Japan, and ironically, not much focus was put on the existence of Mother 1 at all. Most gamers who purchased the game were fixated on the inclusion of Mother 2, thus pushing Mother 1 to the side, as was typical of the two titles. 
There were a fair amount of commercials and press releases for the game, and I think it did a fantastic job sparking the fire back in the Japanese Mother fans' eyes, salivating at the upcoming drop of Mother 3. I distinctly remember following forums and message boards talking about the game's release and being sad that we still didn't have any new Mother updates in the States. People who pre-ordered Mother 1 and 2 even got a sweet Mr. Saturn cell phone strap, which, uh, yeah, it's, uh, pretty much doesn't have a use anymore. An interesting fact to point out here was that the Mother 1 and 2 release was actually the translation that Hacker Tomato was working on when the prototype was found. Many of the changes from the original Mother game were found in Mother 1 and 2, and the list is pretty lengthy. Ironically, both the Mother and Earthbound found in the Game Boy Advance version were reported from the English versions, which explains why the Earthbound Zero prototype mimicked the release so closely. This also confirmed that more copies of the prototype must have existed since the game was ported from English. Mother was back and better than ever, and Japanese gamers couldn't get enough. The years came and went, but Nintendo failed to port Mother to North America. Even after the series had blown up in popularity after the release of Mother 3 and Lucas appearing in Super Smash Bros. Brawl, there was still no movement. Between this and the lack of a Mother 3 localization, fans were understandably outraged. How is it that after 20 years of the inaugural title's release, there was still no headway to localizing the game? Well, that brings us to discussing one of the most beloved Nintendo executives of all time and dear friend to Shigesato Itoi, Satoru Awata. See, many people may not realize how important Awata was to many of Nintendo's decisions in the 90s and 2000s. He was what saved Mother 2 from cancellation. He almost single-handedly brought Pokemon to the West. Behind Miyamoto, Awata is arguably Nintendo's most recognized icon. One of the very last things Iwata did when at Nintendo was to commit to bringing Mother 1 to the Wii U Virtual Console, in English. Known as Earthbound Beginnings, Iwata brought Itoi's dream to a reality, and after 25 long and grueling years, Western gamers were able to play Mother in an official capacity. 25 years. To make it even more fitting, the announcement came out of nowhere during the 2015 Nintendo World Championships, leaving many a mix of excited and dumbfounded. Yeah, so, um, please watch yourself. <laughs> oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! Oh! Not long after Nintendo's decision to port Mother to the Wii U, Satoru Iwata passed away, leaving a lasting legacy that would touch many Nintendo fans' hearts for years after his death. Behind Itoi himself, the Mother series didn't mean as much to anyone but Iwata. He and Itoi spent nights in the president of Nintendo's office when crunched for finishing Mother 2, and his dedication showed in both games he was involved with. Earthbound Beginnings is a fantastic port of the original Mother title, and it plays strikingly similar to Earthbound Zero's prototype and is, in my opinion, the best legitimate way to play the game. Ironically, in 2021, this is still available for purchase, so if you have a Wii U, I recommend picking it up. Sure, there are still less than legitimate ways to play Mother if you can't read Japanese or own a Wii U. The Mother 25th Anniversary Edition is the definitive way to play the original Mother title, if you ask me. It takes everything I loved about the original game and adjusts some irritating items such as Battletech speed, difficulty, and preserving Tomato's translation and many of the other Earthbound Zero localization aspects. It even has reimaginings for the enemy sprites and plenty of other items to make the experience one you won't soon forget. I'll be sure to leave a link to the ROM hack below if you're interested in checking it out. As with many other longtime fans of the series, I first played Mother after Earthbound and Mother 3. That being said, my views on the game as a whole will probably differ from someone who played them in order. Mother, to me, was an acquired taste, and a game I had to play multiple times to truly appreciate. 
I feel that many people write off the first game completely because in all honesty, most games on the NES have not aged particularly well. 8-bit gaming as a whole is a bit primitive both graphically and mechanically, so there were many limitations on games that otherwise could have stood the test of time. Personally, I think Mother is a charming enough game to break these limitations and stand on a precipice of its own. Another reason that some gamers write off Mother is that they see it as a light version of Earthbound, and that's understandable. That's honestly what I thought of it the first few times I booted it up, and I just kept thinking, well, this just isn't Earthbound. Why am I even playing this? It has a similar looking main character, reused music tracks, and well, the overarching story is kind of similar. But the more I looked into the game, I found a uniqueness to it that affected me greatly. See, Mother is not Earthbound. Mother, in some ways, is drier and darker than its successor. It's much more difficult. The enemies all seem directly tied to the main conflict. I felt more alone during my Mother playthrough. It really does strike me as one of the finest games on the NES. As previously mentioned, the music in Mother is exceptional, especially for an NES game. It can easily get overshadowed by the other two games in the series, but the atmosphere that some of those music tracks create get me lost in those 8-bit sprites. Despite the limitations in chord progression and instrumentation, it's amazing to me what can be done in a 90-second song. Many of the tracks are not overly complex, thus crafting a simple tranquility when traversing through towns and stores. The battle themes can shape the proper mood and give the player a rise in their anxiety. The suspense can be killer. The music of Mother says so much in so few notes. In contrast to Earthbound and Mother 3, the themes work more as a complement to the game than being standout tracks of their own. I love it. Oh, and don't even get me started on that absolute banger of a track roving tank. How in the world is that song even coming from an NES sound chip? The characters in Mother are all incredibly relatable in some fashion or another. Considering Ninten is literally known as Boku in the Famicom instruction manual, it was Itoi's overall vision to create that seamless production and put you into the game. Throughout the game, Ninten stays mostly speechless, other than a few yes and no responses. This allows for players' own thoughts and feelings to be placed into the foreground, and believe me, I had a lot of them when playing this game. Lloyd reminded me a lot of myself for his brainy tendencies and shyness. In this way, I found him much different than Jeff and Anuts in Earthbound because he drives a freaking tank. Okay, yeah, that was, a, that was awesome too, but his actions and mannerisms just related so much to my own that it was scary. Anna was the crush that Nintendo needed. And although they were only 12 years old, throughout the incredibly scary moments they faced when together, the relationship blossomed into something way more mature than it deserved to be. But without a doubt, my favorite character in the entire game was Teddy. To me, there was something about watching a macho man gang leader get roped into following a bunch of little kids around and how much he grew as a character throughout playing Mother. Even Geek, the main antagonist of the game, showed an incredible amount of depth in the tiny bit of screen time that he was shown. He even mentions during the final battle how he didn't want to harm Nintendo and his friends out of respect for Maria, which showed his humanity and discernment from right and wrong. But it was his responsibility as a prominent figure in the alien race trying to destroy the Earth. To me, the characters in Mother were so incredibly fleshed out and unique compared to any other game on the NES or Famicom. Even the NPCs that would seemingly have no purpose each had their own thoughts, their own objectives, and they assuredly made no sense at all sometimes. This was a true testament to the skill of Itoi and his team's writing. Despite my affinity for Mother as a whole, there is no question that it has not held up that well over the years. Even the ports of Earthbound Zero and Beginnings, as well as the 25th Anniversary Edition, fail to really subtract the years showing in Mother's early framework. The understandable limitations the Famicom and NES had during the early days of gaming were unavoidable and caused some parts of Mother to appear bare bones or clunky. This was a large reason as to why Earthbound and Mother have so many similarities. 
Itoy's plan for his first video game was so grandiose that in some ways it was physically not possible to happen on the Famicom. The battles were slow, the environments and details can come off as bland, but there's no doubt in my mind that the overall message of the game stays consistent. In my opinion, Mother is a story about love. The title really says it all. The way Maria could love Geek and have him reciprocate back despite being a supernatural being supposedly without feeling. The way Nintendo's family loves him and supports him throughout his journey. The way Anna and the others love Nintendo, willing to sacrifice life and limb to protect their friend. Everywhere you look in Mother, there is some sort of connection to the love of the characters in the game. From the beginning dialogue between Nintendo and his family, to the ending boss battles lullabies, love exists in every nook and cranny in Mother. And as long as we're getting philosophical here, the game itself evokes those same emotions of love and compassion in me. Even today, as I booted up the game to write the final part of this video, seeing the title screen with Mother emblazoned on it, against the subtle music of Mother Earth, I can't help but tear up. Even though this wasn't the game in the series that changed my life, there is something magical about watching that spinning Earth knowing that I am just a speck on it. Just like Ninten, a seemingly unimportant boy who the weight and responsibility of the world was placed on. It helps me to know that anyone can do something special. Anyone can experience friendship. Anyone can experience love. Anyone can go on an adventure of their own. Mother may not have gained the same praise or cult following as its successors, but one thing remains clear. It sparked something magical. Itoy's vision, coupled with the unbelievably talented dev team, created a sleeping giant. It was a game that was markedly ahead of its time and too witty for its own good. Despite the initial lack of a Western release, Mother did something that no other game had done up to that point confidently shirked the status quo for its genre and came out glowing as a result. Nowadays, deconstructions and genre-bending games have become more mainstream, especially with the omnipotence of indie games available for us to download and play at any time. However, especially for the time period, a lot can be said for the tenacity of Itoi-san and his relentless drive to pursue what he loved. The many stories about the releases, ports, localizations, and such are fascinating, and really bring into light the adoration the Mother community has for this game, despite the overwhelmingly higher popularity of the other two titles. Mother's theme of love, mixed with its incredible music and profound dialogue and characters, help it transcend the limitations of the dated console it was launched on. Itoi set out to create a game based on his dreams and experiences and succeeded. But, as we all know, he wasn't done just yet. The next chapter of his vision into the Mother series was set to begin. <laughs>